Dr. Pevick is the only one who complained about the snow. I guess he doesn't like the spring conditions. Uh, everyone, I, everyone I rode the lift with said that it was okay, that it was nice and clear and warm and pleasant. But it was getting a little windy, and about half an hour ago, that's what it looked like up there. So I, I'll just touch bases with, with uh, you on a couple of subjects, talk about some objectives for this afternoon, and, and get into the, uh, the meat of the afternoon program, uh, starting with uh, Willie Chi. A couple of things we'll be talking about is uh, Discuss, continuing the discussion that was started this morning on the medical management of patients to, after revascularization, optimize patency of, of reconstructions, uh, management of challenging renal failure patients, both on the hemoaccess side and talking a little bit about some of the challenges of uh, limb salvage with critical limb ischemia in in-stage renal disease. Um, I think there's some questions that have been brought up about the role of uh, combined antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapies, and we'll hear a little bit about uh, hypercoagulable states uh, in the next talk. Uh, and uh, talk about how to manage some, uh, some challenging endovascular cases with uh, tips for access. Um, also, we'll uh, be addressing stent technologies for uh, uh, peripheral artery work, in particular femoral, popteal, and tibial revascularization. Uh, we'll be hearing about the regenerative medicine options for critical limb ischemia, and I think it's worthwhile to discuss some of the uh, current roles for angiogenesis and, and stem cell ther therapies. Um, and then um, also, not to ignore the, the, the uh, surgical option, we'll uh, have available for discussions topics of surgical revascularization, both the straightforward cases and for complex patients. Well, that's uh, really what I've got for the, kind of an introduction to the afternoon. What I'd like to do is once again bring up Willie Chi, uh, who is going to talk this afternoon on unexplained thrombosis, how to evaluate uh, for hypercoagulable conditions. Now, if you don't know what a, unexplained thrombosis is, is that's, that's when a perfectly good bypass graft occludes. So, so Willie, maybe you could help us. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I sort of changed my uh, talk a little bit, including my title, because uh, as, as you can see, that hypercoax day, I mean, where are we? Do we know anything? And hopefully, at the end of my talk, you have more questions than answers. So please come and get a hold of me uh, if you have uh, answers for me. Uh, regarding to this talk, I do not have any disclosures. And here we go. The objective of my talk is to uh, basically discuss the coagulants and the anticoagulants, uh, or actually the cascades, believe it or not. The mechanism of thrombosis, we'll be talking about some of the uh, more commonly associated factor V lighten as well as the prothrombin gene mutation. Uh, Hypercoag testing, we touched a little bit about antiphospholipid syndrome, and lastly, I'll spend some time about uh, some of the novel risk factor to detect VTE recurrence. This is actually my first slide, Virchow's triad. I'm pretty sure that everybody in the room knows about this uh, graph here. To form a thrombus, you can't really just have one thing, but you need to have a combination of different things. And that includes stasis, that includes uh, vascular endothelial damage, as well as black blood coagulation changes. Now, this is the question for you all. Where do most of the coagulants and, and the anticoagulants come from? Okay, this has nothing to do with the gauntlet, by the way. So just go ahead and uh, think about that answer, and I'm gonna give you the answer right now. Da, 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 da. Okay, there you go. So the answer is that endothelium, okay? So most of the coagulants and the anticoagulants come from the endothelium, including pi-1, your von Willenberg uh, factors, your anticoagulants, including something like heparin or tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Now, the liver is also involved. Uh, liver also produces some coagulants, such as your serum proteases, as well as anticoagulants, such as your protein CS, as well as your antithrombin-3. Now, what about your bone marrow? Your bone marrow primarily produces cells that, uh, that are involved in the coagulation pathway. So let's look at this uh, coagulation graph that uh, most of us are familiar with from our school, from our years in medical school. Both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway come down to the final pathway involving factor 10 as well as 5. And with that activated complex, your prothrombin, which is really factor 2, gets uh, converted into thrombin. And the thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into your activated fibrin. And that's where the red clot comes in. And your thrombin along the same line is going to activate your platelets. What about the anticoagulants? Well, actually, this graph came from my uh, prior mentor, Steve Deicher, who was at Cleveland Clinic, but he's currently a CEO at one of the pharmaceutical companies in the Bay Area now. Um, he actually gave me this graph, and I think it's a very interesting graph, because what, what he did was simply looking at 
your activated protein C, and what does the activated protein, uh, activated protein C do? Well, the activated protein C really degrades your factor five and your factor eight, the active form, into the inactivated form. Now, having said that, what about a clot? What about when the clot is already formed? Well, you, you have your plasmin, which is going to degrade your fiber network, and then that's, you know, that's where your fiber degradation product is going to come in. So as you can see, it's really a delicate balance between the amount of uh, anticoagulants you have versus the, the coagulants. If you have more or less of one or another, then you know, something will happen. Either you bleed or actually you would have a hypocoag condition or a clot formation. This is what a clot looks like on an ultrasound. And what you have is basically a pre-compression picture showing an ultrasound with a echogenicity within it, in a post-compression picture. Can you tell the difference? No. And that's how we detect clots, really, on an ultrasound, looking at a pre- and post-compression picture. But, you know, obviously this is obvious from, um, I'm not sure if you can see uh, up on your seats, but you can see some echogenicity both before and after the compression. Now, the next slide we're going to have is a question. Where do most of the DVTs form? Think about that answer. And here you go. So for those of you who choose venous sinusoid, you have a right. Well, what is venous sinusoid? Well, venous sinusoid is this little area that's right around the cups. And, uh, and the reason why it developed clots there is because, uh, it's, because uh, it's hemodynamically different than endothelial cells lining um, veins elsewhere. And as you can see here from my graph, you have platelet that are being aggregated in that area. And then with, when that platelet is aggravated, your, front, your coagulation cascade begin to, uh, begin to um, uh, occur. And then you have uh, this uh, thrombus formation. And how we tell really activated or active uh, clot versus a non-acute clot or old clot is really the platelet activation. So for those of you who have done research in the past, looking at uh, whether the clot is old or, or young, the way that we look at it in the lab is actually looking at the platelet activation. So going back to what I said about why would venous sinusoid be the lead cause of DVT, well, it's because of this, uh, these cells are lining the cups. Uh, it actually has less or reduced uh, blood velocity. And so in, in other words, stagnant blood flow. Well, anything that has stagnant blood flow tends to accumulate. And, uh, and lo and behold, around this region here, that the blood within the cups is also hypoxic. So with those two environmental setups, and what you have is you have a tendency for leukocytes and platelet to aggregate and to form. And that's really the reason why that the venous sinusoids are the first place to have a DVT form. And when that DVT form extends, that's when you're, you can see it on the ultrasounds and whatnot. So um, hypocoax, they really do not cause clots. It's the environmental trigger. Okay, that led to it. And the typical graph I show my patients as well as the residents and fellows is this cartoon here showing a man that's about to fall off a cliff. So hypocoag condition only puts you at the edge of the cliff. The environmental triggers, such as any type of stress, you know, you're in the hospital, you had a fractured leg, you had surgery, those are environmental triggers that will push you over the edge and then you will fall down the cliff. Now, having said that, there are a host of different hypocoag conditions. On my left, which is red here, it's the more commonly known. But do you also know that you could have thrombomodulin deficiency? Um, I want to have a show of hands of anybody that have detected anybody with thrombomodulin deficiency. I certainly have not. And, and the reason being is because that there are a whole host of disorders that we know of, but we have no assay of detecting for them. And obviously, we could categorize these disorders into whether they're congenital, acquired, or both. So if we were to go back to the 1990s and looking at how good are we doing with the hypocoag state detection, well, we do a very poor job. As you can see, 83% of them, we can't even find. Doesn't mean the patient don't have it, just not, we don't have the technology or the assay of detecting the hypocoag condition. Well, what about a decade later, in 2003? Well, we do a better job, but still about a third that we still can't detect for. And the reason being is because, again, that there is a host of different hypocoag conditions that we don't have the assays for. And while you ask that, well, you know, 10 years ago, you 83% you can't detect, and now it's 32%. So what about that 50% of patients? Well, those 50% of patients really belong to two categories. And those are the factor five, as well as the prothrombogenic mutations, which we'll be talking about 
right now. So the prevalence of disorder, as you can see from the graph here, is, uh, is that the factor five, as well as the hyperhomocysteine, which is really a moderate factor, and not, uh, you know, hyperhomocysteine is really associated with everything uh, out in the world, so I sort of throw that one out, because it's really at the most a moderate factor. But more importantly, the factor five, the prothrombin gene mutation, as well as high, high factor A concentration level are really the predominant uh, players uh, in the hypocoag uh, world uh, nowadays. And if we were to look at uh, first uh, DVT or versus recurrent VT, what you could see is that APCR or activated protein C-resistant, which is what factor five lighting belongs to, have a majority greater than 50% of those patients with recurrent VTEs. So if we were to simply talk about factor five, we really can't talk about factor five lighting without talking about and uh, activated protein, three, uh, protein uh, C resistance. So what is the difference? Well, activated protein C resistance is really a, a, a pathologic uh, condition in the laboratory, uh, which is uh, manifested by decreasing in vitro plasma uh, anticoagulant response to the natural anticoagulation. And uh, the way we detect it is called the CLOT method. It's basically a, a ratio of timing, uh, APTT with and without APC. So as you could see that from from just the ratio that uh, with somebody with activated protein C resistance, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get the ratio being low. Uh, what about factor V? Well, factor V is really a genetic mutation. It's a point mutation uh, in the factor V gene, and the way we detect it is through PCR technique using uh, uh, what we call the invader, uh, invader uh, series. So, in other words, uh, what you have is uh, factor V. Anybody with factor V will have activated protein C resistance but not all patients with activated protein C resistance will have factor V mutation because 8% of APCR is due to pregnancy, oral contraceptive use, antiphospholipid syndrome, other factor V mutations such as factor V Hong Kong, and also factor VIII excess. So in conclusion of the factor V, factor V Leiden equals to APC resistance but APC resistance does not mean that you have factor V because there's still that 8% of patients will have other diseases. So next, let's talk about the risks associated with factor V lighting. Well, if you have heterozygous mutation with the factor V gene, you have a seven-fold increase in risk of thrombus. Uh, what about if you're homozygous, 80%? I personally have only seen one or two patients with homozygous uh, factor V uh, lighter mutation, because usually these patients, uh, actually not patients, but they die in utero, so they, they basically um, uh, are, are miscarried uh, rather than uh, being born alive. Um, if you have factor V lighter or prothrombin gene mutation, there is about a 2.6-fold increase for recurrent VT, not the first time, but recurrent VT. So our next step is to talk about prothrombin gene mutation. Well, pro prothrombin gene mutation uh, is basically a mutation of the prothrombin gene, so you have a continual activation of the prothrombin gene, and then lead to thrombin formation. So the, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip through it. Uh, for the prothrombin gene mutation, what you have is a heterozygous uh, mutation, uh, increases the risk of about two to seven folds. Uh, the one thing I have you remember about uh, prothrombin gene mutation is that if you have a, a gal with cerebral vein thrombosis, you really, you really need to think about uh, PT20210. Um, now, hypocoag testing, who, where, why? Well, in the past, we typically do hypocoag testing, everybody with idiopathic DVT. Well, is that the right way to do it? Personally, I don't think so, because it leads to more question than answer. And as you can see, you could read off on the list that there's a whole host of, of who to test for. What about when to test for? Well, actually, I will pose the question of when not to test for, simply because that you need to avoid testing during acute illness and acute thrombosis. And then why to test for? Well, you need to have a reason why you would do it. If it does not impact your management, you should never do the test. So just to know is not really appropriate. So what does the ACCP consensus say? Well, if you look at the documentation that was published in 2008, basically there's no answer. Uh, it gives you about uh, three months treatment for any VTEs. But as far as long-term therapy, it's a, it's a very vague term, long-term therapy. Well, is it a year, two years, is it three years? We do not know. Now, the reason why we do not know is because of studies such as PREVENT. PREVENT is a, a wonderful design study from Paul Redeker. And what he did was that he looked at uh, patients with idiopathic DVT that uh, were uh, suffice standard treatment. It was randomized to either placebo or low-intensity cumin therapy. And what he had found 
is that those patients who suffice their um, standard care and were randomized to the low intensity uh, warfarin group with a target INR of 1.5 to 1.9 actually did better than the placebo. But more interestingly, if you were to look at the group that have hypocoagulant condition versus who do not have a hypocoagulant condition, those patients did not do any differently. So what that tells you is that, again, like what I said before, just because you can't detect that in the patient doesn't mean the patient don't have it. The second study I'll be talking about is the late study from Cleve Curran study from Cleve Curran's group uh, in McMaster, looking at the same basic population except that he randomized the patient to, to a low intensive Coumadin group versus conventional intensity Coumadin group. The basically the same patient uh, outcome. And what he had found is basically the same type of curve, that patients actually have less recurrence if they were randomized to the conventional group. Looking at patients with hypercoagulant condition versus who do not have hypercoagulant condition, what you do see is that, again, those patients who did not test positive for either factor V or prothrombin mutation did just as well as those who did test positive for the mutation. Again, both on pre and ELA study, both the study concurred the same conclusion. Now, what about anticoagulation and APS? I only have one slide on this. Basically, you should not treat these patients with a target RNR, with a target RNR of 3.1 to 4. You should really just target RNR to 2 to 3 because, uh, believe it or not, those patients who are targeted 2 to 3 actually has less recurrence of thrombus than those who are treated with higher uh, coumadin level or RNR level. What about thrombophilia and recurrent VTE? Well, this actually came from the ELA trial. It's a follow-up from Cleve Clearon's uh, ELA trial. Uh, those who are either taking low intensity or conventional intensity Coumadin, actually, uh, most of these patients, even with the, anti even with the hypercoagulant condition, they, they actually did not have any recurrent, uh, recurrence of VTE, except for those with antiphospholipid antibody. Abdominal vein thrombosis, I only have one slide on this. Uh, Whenever you see weird thrombosis, make sure the patient don't have cancer, and that's, about, that's the bottom line, whether it be solid tumor or hematologic tumors. And then for those patients with adrenal thrombosis, uh, think about those patients that you put heparin on, and all of a sudden the pressure drop, and they code, and you cannot find a bleeding source because those patients actually manifest as adrenal hemorrhage. And, but the hemorrhage itself is actually a conclusion or a consequence of uh, adrenal vein thrombosis or adrenal thrombosis. So if there's anything else we could do to risk assess for recurrent VTE, well, there's some interesting study that was done over the last decade uh, looking at this question. D-dimer, we all know that it's actually a very highly negative predictor for DVT. So we could diagnose, basically, we could actually rule out DVT based on D-dimer. But do you know that we could also risk assess for future recurrence of VTE using D-dimer? So here's a study came from um, Polyrati School from Bologna, Italy, looking at patients with idiopathic uh, VTE and, uh, and those with thrombophilia, existing thrombophilia, and looking at their D-dimer level. Those who have higher D-dimer level in those either one of the group, either idiopathic or have an existing thrombophilia, have a higher risk of recurrence of their VTE. And Shura Vestava from uh, Paul Riddick's group looking at the same thing and concurred the same conclusion that those with a higher level D-dimer after their initial VTE event actually had a higher risk of VT recurrence. Uh, he also continued to look at factor A level. Again, the same conclusion that higher factor A level in patient with existing VTE or a diagnosis of prior VTE actually have a higher risk of recurrence. Now, Paul Riley actually took the step one, uh, uh, took a step further, and what he did was that he basically randomized those group, the group of patients with uh, abnormal D-dimer into taking Coumadin versus stopping the Coumadin, and what he found was that there's a 6.11 relative risk of reduction in those who actually had a high or abnormal D-dimer level who took Coumadin versus those who did not take Coumadin but have a high uh, D-dimer level. And what about ultrasound VT recurrence? Uh, I'm pretty sure that some of you is aware of uh, Paolo Pardoni's uh, study from Padua, Italy, looking at ultrasound guidance uh, and uh, determine whether the patient should be treated with Coumadin uh, long term or not. And what he had found was that those patients who were treated additional, meaning prolonged Coumadin treatment uh, with evidence of residual thrombus on ultrasound actually did better than those patients who did not, who did, was not follow uh, on ultrasound. So again, uh, very interesting work that was done in the, the European group. So what do I do? Well, I only do hypercoag condition if, uh, or workup if it, it 
if it changes my management. Uh, usually, I could tell you that the last time I did it was a couple years ago, because uh, I do it less and less, simply because it, it doesn't change my management. Occasionally, I do do it if a patient persists and asks me to go ahead and, and uh, give him an answer. Um, but, uh, but typically, for a patient with uh, provoked, uh, meaning a secondary DVT, I would treat them for anywhere from three to six months. If they have a PE, I will usually treat them for about six to 12 months. If it's idiopathic, first time, doesn't matter if DVT or PE, and based on current literature, elate and prevent that I just showed you, I will actually definitely treat them for anywhere from 12 to four, 24 months. Um, because again, from, from those uh, literature, we know that the longer you treat these patients, the less the recurrence. And obviously, if the patient have many uh, episodes of clots, um, over their, over their years, then I would certainly uh, treat them for lifelong, uh, and that would be long term. And I'm sorry that I went over time, uh, but uh, I guess I will answer questions at the end. And there are some new anticoagulants. So thank you all for your attention.